Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you. Subhanallah. It's really, really excellent. I can't, I just, subhanallah, it's been too long not being able to look out and see all of our dear sisters and this number of women that are here today. And of course, the many who are online as well. We, we see you virtually, mashallah. There's about over 200, I think, of them online as well. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Sisters, I'm really excited. This has been a wonderful day, and it's going to continue to get even more and more and more wonderful, subhanAllah. I'm excited for you because of all of the women scholars and teachers who you're going to be hearing from and have already been hearing from, and how, subhanAllah, as we said at the very beginning, they're all so different, just like the mothers of our believers and just like the women of the, of the, that are mentioned in the hadith that are um, guaranteed paradise, they're all very different too. There are strings of themes that are actually tied between all of them that we're going to mention today. But subhanAllah, what is absolutely clear to all of us is that when you see yourself in one or more of these amazing archetypes, both historically or modern, it inspires you to be able to reach higher, do more, dig your iman deeper, get your, firm, your roots firmer in Islam, inshaAllah. That's our goal. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability, inshallah, to really benefit from what's here today. And I hope, inshallah, that you'll continue to follow along with the Rahmah Foundation and the Jannah Institute because subhanAllah, in each of the, and there's weekly halakas that both offer, and it's really important that you're rooted to something. So if you've been feeling unrooted for some time, please re-root yourself, inshallah, with these women's halakas. Ours are on Friday nights, they're typically here. It's possible that by January we might actually be back in person make dua, inshallah, I mean, but we'll continue the hybrid model where you're able to join online as well, because I know some of you are very far um, away, and some of our online folks, subhanAllah, are international. <laughs> Allahu Akbar to all of our sisters from across the world to join in. Today, inshallah, I'm going to be covering Sitna Khadija, Khadija bint Khawailid, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in her story, which many of, we, many of you know, I mean, Everything I'm going to say here is probably review, by and large. But the reason we review and re-review is because, subhanAllah, every time we uncover something beautiful, a gem that we haven't really thought of before, or maybe we haven't paid attention to in some long period of time, and then you draw connections to your own life or the life of other sisters around you, and it suddenly all clicks together, subhanAllah. Khadija radiallahu anha, her name literally means the one who was born early. She was born premature. She was born earlier than her parents expected her to be. And hence her name. But at the very end of our talk, we're going to sum it up by saying she wasn't just born into this dunya early. She was also early ahead of her time and ahead of her generation and ahead of most women of society, including today. Right? And her beliefs and what she accomplished was well ahead of many, subhanAllah. And so as we look at Satina Khadija radiallahu anha, we have to start actually with her parents. This is a theme today. Every single one of the stories we've said so far, we started with the generation before them, right? Because you don't just sort of come into the world. You come into a family that's already in existence, subhanAllah, and then you start to shape who you are after that. Well, her parents, mashallah, were noble people of Quraysh. And her father, had a dream while uh, his wife, Khadija's mother, was pregnant. And he woke up very excited because he saw in this dream that he was gathering, that he was a young boy, and he had his, you know how you kind of take your shirt to gather fruit, you know, in it? And there were dates, really ripe dates. And they were being put into his shirt. And as much as he, they were putting these dates, it wouldn't fill. And then he was able to taste this date, you know, and then suddenly he woke up, realizing it's a dream. So he got very excited and he went to his wife and he said, I think we're going to have a boy. Another theme, inshallah, <laughs> of today, right? And she, his wife kind of just, you know, isn't as excited as he is. And she asks her, why, why are you not, you know, so excited? And she says, because in the dream, it, it, her interpretation, what she had learned is that dates mean girls. And this would be their firstborn. And in Quraysh, in that society, this is pre-Islamic, right? In that tribal pre-Islamic society, having your firstborn be a girl meant possibly that it would have, uh, that they would be buried alive, 
female infanticide, because it was shameful. The first had to be a boy. And he comes from a very honorable family, and there was expectations. This is Khwailid, his father is Asad. And there's expectations that the firstborn of the, the great noble man, Asad, his father, would be a, a boy, a grandson. And so, as you can imagine, now comes the birth, and she, she, Sutana Khadija, as we now know, right, is of course a girl, and born early. And his, her father, Khwailid, is very worried, because he's worried that as soon as they see that it's a girl, they're going to advise him to bury her alive. So the sisters, at this point, this is what I want you to do. Those of you who are taking notes, I want you to make a, a table. Uh, put three columns, three categories, OK? We're going to try to fill this out together. Put a column, inshallah, the first one, and call it things that are unique about Satina Khadija. Unique in her time, but honestly, even unique in our times. The second column, please put things that don't seem as they really are. Things in the story that you pick up as we're talking that don't seem exactly as they actually are. And the third column is every time we mention something and there's a characteristic, a character trait, because you want to come out with this from this lecture with something, inshallah, that's very tangible for you to take, right? So things that are first column, things that are unique about her. Second column, things that are not quite what they seem. And the third column, any characteristics that you hear, start making this long, probably it's going to be a very long list of characteristics of Satina Khadija. And so, here comes the birth of Satina Khadija, and her father is trembling, kind of really worried. His father, Asad, has come, and all the rest of his you know, tribe has come, and they're waiting to see. And the news comes out that this is a girl, and he's worried. But then he sees that his father, right, Khadija's grandfather, is looking at her almost like with a change of heart. She seems something very special. Like, they talk about how, like, she's very light, as in nur, light, like light emanating from her. They see kind of a light, a nur. And at that point in time, the head of the tribe is none other than, I wonder who can tell me, do you guys know who would be the head of Quraysh at this period of time? Abdul Muttalib. Who is whom? the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad right? So like distant, distant, There's a, there is a connection between them, but it's not like direct, right? But he's the head, okay, of the tribe. So he comes too. And so here is her grandfather, Asad, and here is the head of Quraysh, Abdul Muttalib. And they're standing there, and they're kind of wondering about this girl, who is a girl, not a boy, but is very like, has all this nur, light, kind of emanating from her. And at that period in time, it's like Allah put something in their heart to change it. And at that point, Abdul Muttalib, who would have given kind of a small gift if it was a girl, this is all jahili, like pre-Islamic, you know, time of ignorance, right? A small gift if it was a girl and a large gift if it was a boy. And suddenly, not only did he give the gift that he was coming to give, but he emptied out all of his pockets and everything he had. He just felt in his heart, this is going to be a special person. So in your column of things that are not quite what they seem, right, and things, right, in this case, also things that are unique to her, right, she would have died, but Allah has saved her for something very, very important and special that's to come, inshallah ta'ala. And so we continue on, and there's something very unique about her, of course, is this born kind of with this light, subhanAllah. Now, her father and her mother decide that also very unique in her time is to educate her. Her cousin, who's much, much older, several decades older, maybe about 50 or so years older than her, is her cousin, Waraka. You know this name, Waraka ibn Nawfal. And so they take her as a little girl to Waraka to be taught by him. He's a learned man. He's studied the gospel. He's studied the Torah. He's studied so many different things. And he becomes her personal teacher. And so she studies with him for years. Right? And she becomes, she's able to read, she's able to write, and she's very bright. And the news gets out about her that this, not only is she very beautiful, but she's also very intelligent. And so she's got marriage proposals coming in left and right. And her and her family reject them, reject them, reject them, reject them, right? Until she reaches 15 years. At that point, her family says, she's got to get married. And let me just pause here for a moment. When we talk about young ages, don't think about yourself in 2021 in this era trying to understand 
young aged marriage. You have to put yourself back in that society back in that time, where if your life expectancy is about 30, then 15 is half your life. It makes sense to get married then. In fact, many of the girls of her era would have already been married. Do you see what I'm saying? So before people start making a fuss, think about that. You know this. You know this because how old were the Prophet's parents, both, both, when they passed away, uh, uh, the Prophet Wasallam's parents? They married young. His father didn't even see the Prophet Wasallam. So what does that put him age-wise? He hadn't reached 20. Sitna Amina, his mother, had also passed away just years into the Prophet's toddlerhood. People died young in that age. Do you see what I'm saying? So here she is at the age of 15, back to Siddha Khadija. And she passed, so it's time for her to get married. And she doesn't necessarily want to, but she knows that this is something that her society and her parents want of her. And when the proposal comes, right, and this is now, uh, his name is Abu Hala, who comes to propose, they can't really say no. He's honest, he's hardworking, he's honorable, he has an honorable lineage, and he's also, he's also wealthy, which becomes an important point that we'll talk about in a moment. He has everything in a Meccan society that would be important for someone of her nobility and stature. So she asks her parents, they say this is a good fit. She asks her uncle and teacher, her cousin rather, and teacher Waraka, he says this is a good fit, and so she agrees. She gets married at the age of 15, and here we start to see some really important things start to happen. You talk about difficulties and trials. We heard from, about Sitna Maryam. We heard about Sitna Asya, both of which had very difficult trials. So what is it about Sitna Khadija? Well, here starts the story of many things to come. She's widowed only two years after getting married. And not only that, but she's had two children. She's had Hala and Hind, who are boys. If you're wondering, for anybody who's kind of familiar with the names as being girl names, <laughs> why are the boys girl names? It's because there was a Jahili, you know, pre-Islamic society, a thing of like protecting any nazar or ayn or evil eye from the boys by naming them girls. And that's how low would society girls were considered. Right? They won't be given the evil eye if they're, they're girls. So she has Hala and she has Hind, the two boys, and her husband, Abu Hala, passes away, right, before even the second one is born. So here she is at 17, a widow and a single mother. More themes, right? You seeing the similarity here? Yeah. And so at that point in time, she decides, she's very, mashallah, very a bright person, so she decides to actually, uh, because she's in Hera, this is an important part, because Abu Hala was very wealthy, she inherits a large sum of money. You know in the column where you're writing, things don't always seem as they are? So you think that somebody who has lost their husband and is widowed at 17 and a single mother of two children, it would be disastrous and very difficult. Well, things are not always what they seem. Because what if it was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Abu Hala in her path to allow her to have somebody not only to have these children, subhanAllah, but also she inherited a good sum of money. And with this money, she could have just used it easily and kind of sat in her, you know, high level of society, of elite of Mecca, right? And just, you know, took care of her kids. But she decided to put that brilliance into business. And so she does something else in the column of unique for her time. She becomes a businesswoman. And not only does she become a businesswoman, because you could outsource this and have it to other men to run your business. No, she runs it herself. And she, they, it's noticed about her that every time her caravan goes out, it comes back with more profit compared to the other men. <laughs> She's doing really well. Very intelligent, mashallah. And it's almost like I don't need to do exactly the stereotype of every other woman of society. This is what Allah has written for me, and I'm going to make the best of it. So she dedicates herself to business and to raising her children. Now, she's very young still. And in that society, it's expected that she would be married again. And so proposals keep coming in. And now, add to everything else we said already in the list of characteristics, she's wealthy. <laughs> Even more reason. Every person wants to propose to her. 
And she turns them down, turns them down, turns them down, until we get to a man named Atiq. And similar to her first husband, Abu Hala, he's also from a noble lineage. He himself is wealthy, so he's not looking to her wealth. He's independently wealthy. And he's industrious, a hard worker. And so her family and her advisor and teacher, Waraka, and everybody else agrees that this would be a good fit for her and a, 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 you know, a good match. And so she goes ahead and marries for the second time at the age of 17. And she has a girl from this marriage named Hinda. Now, very similar to the first marriage, after Hinda is born, her father is going out to the caravan with the caravan and never returns. He passes away. She's widowed twice over and three children. Twice widowed and three children. In this period of time, this and even to today, put yourself in even today's shoes, this is difficult, this is heavy, this is what do you do with this exactly? What does she do, Satana Khadija? She takes all of this and she turns it into, again, Allah wrote this for me, therefore I'm going to surrender to what he's written to me, for me. And she's doing well business-wise, so she dedicates all her energy into business and her family. And she forgets about marriage. She says, I've tried this, clearly it wasn't written for me, right? Every time she gets married, within two years the husband dies, subhanAllah, right? So now she's a businesswoman, and for years, years, maybe 15 years, this is what she's doing dedicated to her business, doing very well, mashallah, successful, and something very unique about her, unlike the woman of her time. She's very tuned into the poor, the needy, the orphans, and she uses her wealth to help these folks. Not only that, but also unlike the woman of her time, especially the elite, kind of wealthy woman of Mecca, she takes care of her children by herself. She doesn't have, she, re, she leads a simple life not a luxurious life that she could have led because she's wealthy, but she decides to do things for herself by herself, which allows her to have empathy and understand those who don't have a lot. So now, as we fast forward into the story, 15 years of this story, subhanAllah, but something important happens when she's 34 years old. Her father passes away. And her father, of course, is a very important person to her. And within a very short period of time, her mother passes away as well. So suddenly, she's alone. No parents, no husbands, right? And Waraka, her mentor, is in his 80s. But she keeps on getting advice from him, and she does visit with him very regularly and kind of seeks him out for any advice and help. And in this period of time, she has this discussion with Waraka, Because she hears from him constantly, because he's very, he keeps on saying this message over and over. There is a prophet to come and he's eminent. It's happening. It's in the Torah. It's in the gospel. It is happening. It is coming. So she's hearing this very regularly. And one night she has a dream. She doesn't know what the dream means, but she's she's, she's, just like her father's dream. She's just so happy when she wakes up and doesn't know what to make of it. And so she goes to Waraka to ask, what does this dream mean? And here's how the dream goes. She sees that there's a star in the sky, and it separates from the rest of the stars and falls into her lap, literally. And it enters into her chest and comes out into her arms. And then after that, it ascends, and the entire sky is drenched in light. It's this beautiful dream. And she wakes up happy and just excited about it, but doesn't know what this means. And so she goes to Waraka and explains to him the dream, and he says, The Prophet has come. The Prophet has come. This is about the Prophet. And your home will be drenched in light. It'll have light enter into it. And she said, well, it's wonderful. But what does this have to do with me? (laughs) And so he foretells some narrations say that he actually tells her, you will marry the Prophet. And in other narrations, we just know that, you know, he says to her that light is going to enter your home. SubhanAllah. And so in this same period of time, she carries on with her business, and all of you know the story now, now you're going to connect the dots of where, what happens next. She has a caravan going to Damascus. She's in Mecca, there's a caravan going to Damascus, and it's a far distance, three months of a journey, and she needs a very trustworthy person. 
Now, the people of Quraysh hear that Khadija, the wealthy woman, needs a very trustworthy person, so many people want to be this physician. She's going to pay them well. Now, in the same period of time, <laughs> you know the rest of this part, right? Abu Talib, who, is, who exactly is Abu Talib? The uncle of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who's taken in the Prophet وسلم, right after Abdul Muttalib has passed away. So now he's being raised in his uncle's home. He's a young man. He's a, he's a shab, a young man. And, he's, um, and Abu Talib is actually not wealthy. And there are many mouths to feed. And so Abu Talib hears about Khadija's caravan. And so he says to Muhammad, Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, why don't you go and take that job? She'll pay well, and you are trustworthy, and she's looking for a trustworthy person. And the Prophet's nickname was what? Al-Ameen, Sadiq Al-Ameen, very good, inshallah. And so he says, okay, but Yani, what, what would she really, I mean, is, is I going to be Yani, <laughs> the right fit? And so he says, absolutely. And look at how beautiful this is. They send an intermediary, the Prophet's uncle, uh, aunt rather, to ask Satina Khadija, would this be the right fit? Now Satina Khadija is surprised because she's been hearing about Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as a very honorable and kind of trustworthy person, but she doesn't think he'd be very interested in this caravan, right? Because he's like very noble, like, you know, an orphan, not well-to-do, but very honorable, right? And so when they come to have the business discussion about whether or not it should be the prophet, he can't even, he's so modest, he doesn't even look at her, look up at her, he had her face, right? He kind of is looking down while they're having this discussion. And she's very happy because she feels like if it'll be Muhammad taking my caravan over, then I won't be swindled, I won't be cheated, right? Like she's at the mercy of whoever is going to go take the caravan over. And so she decides and says to him, if you take the caravan, I'll give you not just the two camels that are, you know, guaranteed her, you know, that's how much she owes for this, I'll give you more. But it's not about that for the Prophet wasallam, right? It's because his uncle had asked him and said, you know, we need, we need some help here. Why don't you take this job? Anyhow, she's very excited because she notices things immediately about the Prophet wasallam. For example, she notices that honesty kind of right away. And she starts to wonder, you know, because she's been hearing from her, from Waraka, you know, that there's a prophet eminent, but she doesn't know exactly who this is. But she asks Waraka, tell me some descriptions about this person because you speak about them from everything you read in the Gospel and the Torah as though you know what they look like and who they are. And so he says, sure, I'll tell you some characteristics. So this is what he tells her. He says, this person will never reciprocate evil with evil. He will not raise his voice. He is forgiving and he's very merciful. He rides donkeys and camels and he shepherds, you know, he's a shepherd and he milks sheep. He wears patches on his clothing. And he has a sign between his shoulder blades that's called the mark of the prophet that all the other prophets had as well. And his name will be Ahmed. And so she has all of these different uh, characteristics that she knows about him. And she realizes, wow, this is going to be, you know, it'd be amazing if she could possibly get to know who this person is. Well, in that same period of time, there's a rabbi. Now remember, the Jews and the Christians of that era were also being foretold that this prophet is coming. And they're also waiting. But they're hoping it's going to be from their bloodlines, right? <laughs> See, everybody's looking, everybody's looking. But there was a rabbi who came to a group of women where Satina Khadija was standing, and he actually says to them, he says, a woman of Quraysh, the signs are telling us that the prophet is here, and he will be from Quraysh. So if any of you can marry him, then do so. Now all the other women who are sitting with Satina Khadija start laughing at this man. They're like, what kind of jokester is this? What prophet in telling us to marry him? Not only are they laughing at him, they start kind of throwing stones at him to go away. But not her. She hears this and she feels like something enters into her heart, like, oh, I hope that could be me. Do you know when some, you know, for everybody here who's ever thought about, when they were younger, thought about getting married, there's always this kind of like, I wonder who that person will be. <laughs> and a list of characteristics follows. Sometimes it's a little more shallow and sometimes it's a little deeper, <laughs> depending, you know. In this society, people will say, what, what is it? Uh, tall, dark, and handsome. I don't know if you know what that means. But anyway, <laughs> whatever the characteristics people have, right? Anyway, 
Michelle, she had in her heart, imagine, the, put yourself in her shoes for a minute. She had this in her heart, this thing, like, little thing entered her heart, like, if that would be me, what would it be like to be the wife of a prophet? Right? SubhanAllah. So back now to the story about Sayyidina Muhammad, where it's time for him to take her caravan. So she calls her servant. And what's her servant's name? Maysara. And she tells Maysara, this is going to be the leader of the caravan. Do not let him out of your sight. Everything he does, everything he says, I want a full report afterwards. <laughs> she has a sense about him, but she's not really sure, and she wants a full report. So Maysara says, of course. And so off they go on this caravan, and so many things start to happen in this journey that she notices and that he notices, Maysara as well. And you know the stories here. We're not going to repeat all of them because you know them, subhanAllah, of the cloud that sh that's shading the Prophet wasallam wherever he goes. That every time that him, him or Maysara are thirsty, he just kind of hits the ground and water <laughs> springs up from wherever. And they're in the middle of a desert, right? That when they pass by the monk, the Hira, right? who never comes out and doesn't want to ever want to interact with people, he sees from a distance and he rushes over and he sees the, the Prophet sitting under the tree and he rushes to Maysara and says, who's this man? And he says, his name's Muhammad, he's the caravan leader. And he says, no, this is a Prophet and there could be people out to get him. So go quickly, go back to your home, <laughs> right? And so Maysara is you know, worried about this. And, and so, he, so Maysara experiences all these strange happenings that are, that are going on right, about this man. And one of the most important things that he reports back to Sultan Khadija is that in the trade, when the, the Prophet's doing business, it's a customary that you swear upon the idols. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never does that. And so when Maysara hears that, she says, what, did you say that he doesn't swear on the idols? So even from his, subhanAllah, think about how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala puts people and he already has things planned. Sultan Khadija is also a monotheist. Not that Muslim, this is before Islam, but because she was raised and taught by Waraka, who was also a monotheist, he did not believe in the polytheism of that time and the idols. He believed in the one God, and he raised her that way. So she's already a monotheist. And the Prophet, وسلم, since he was a young boy, had rejected polytheism. And you would think, subhanAllah, how Allah has things planned, right? Because of course, whoever is meant to be with the Prophet وسلم, as his wife is not going to, in her past, have been a polytheist. SubhanAllah, right? So here she, so she hears this from Maysara, and hears all these other amazing things, and she feels like, you know, like when that enters into your heart, and you're like, I wonder if this is him. <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. So anyhow, she, she contemplates this, and from two years, back and forth in her head, back and forth, you know, you know how, do, how do I make this move? Because again, in the list of things unique to her, by this point in time, she's 40. And how old is the Prophet He's 25. She's 15 years his senior. So even in that period of time, very similar to today, that's unique. That's not typical. And not only is it not typical, but you know what else isn't typical still to today? Although it has nothing to do with Islam, this is all cultural things, is for her to initiate the proposal to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. See, we're drawing out all of these columns, this column of things that are unique, but also very important that things that are not what they exactly seem, and Allah has an amazing better plan. So you know the story. We won't finish all the parts of this story, but you know the story here where she asks him very beautifully, how does she go about, and uh, Ustadah Husayn was earlier telling us about what happens when you have a good friend, somebody who visits with you and has a pulse on you, and when you're a little off, they can tell. <laughs> and they're like, what's actually wrong? What's actually going on? Are you okay? Right, subhanAllah. And so anyway, she, uh, this is her friend Nafisa. And Nafisa, right, senses there's something going on here, but she does, she wants to ask and kind of pull it out of, Sitina <laughs> Khadija, like friends sometimes pull information out of you, subhanAllah. And so she asks and Nafisa, and, and Sitina Khadija finally says to her, well, I've been thinking about proposing to Muhammad, but I don't know how. I don't know. I mean, not only is it so uncustomary of her time, but how do you do this, right? So being the good friend that Nafisa says, she says, I'll take care of it. <laughs> and she says, really, you'll do that for me? Yes, I'll do that for you. 
And so she does this in a beautiful etiquette way because you don't know, right? What if he's already thinking of someone else? Like, how do you, you know, how do you, you don't want to put her in an embarrassing situation either. So Nafisa goes over to Sayyidina Muhammad and she, it's a very beautiful hall. She asks this, she says to him, you know, her exact words are, what is preventing you from getting married? <laughs> now, are you married? Are you interested? No, no, no. no. Yeah. What's preventing you from getting married? And so the Prophet ﷺ tells, you know, Nafisa, and he says to her, um, I'm not in a financial position to do so. I can't take care of a wife and a family. I don't have the, the means. So Nafisa very smartly says to him, what if the means were not an issue? <laughs> what if that wasn't a problem? What if the woman was wealthy? and beautiful, and honorable. <laughs> and so the Prophet Sallallahu says, well, who's that? <laughs> and she says to him, Khadija. And so he's, you know, he's kind of, he, he didn't say no. He was kind of quiet, and he's interested. And so she's very excited, right? And if he says, I'm about to rush over to Sayyidina Khadija and tell her, you know, that there is a potential here, subhanAllah. Anyhow, she consults, so he, the Prophet ﷺ, consults his uncle Abu Talib, who thinks that this is a good match, and Sayyidina Khadija consults her uncle, right, and they think it's a good match, and subhanAllah, right, for sake of time, we'll just kind of wrap this piece together and say, both families agree, and alhamdulillah, both are represented by their uncles and their wed. SubhanAllah. She's 40, here's 25. She's previously married twice and has three children. He's never been married. What's to come after this is an amazing marriage, something you can take all week talking about the marriage of Sayyidina Khadija and Sayyidina Muhammad Wasallam. Truly when the books say a marriage of bliss and one of hardship and sacrifice, it really is that way, subhanAllah. But it really was blissful for so many things that we're gonna quickly kind of outline here and explain. Unique to Sayyidina Khadija, is after, and she's 40 when she marries, right? Which means that because after that point, with Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, she gives birth to six children. 40 onwards. <laughs> SubhanAllah, right? And two of them are boys who pass away. Qasim and Abdullah. And four of them are girls who live into their adulthood. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kalthum, and Fatima. Dr. Ahmed will speak about Fatima right after this, inshallah. And when you think about who she is as a wife to the Prophet ﷺ, remember, she has her business, and she's independently wealthy, and she's educated, and she knows and has been told that this is going to be a hard path. But she's signed up for it. She's already surrendered her life to whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her. And something about being a beautiful wife, like a really honorable wife, is that you push, this is something, I can't wait for Haile Sosan to come. There's so many stories and messages in here that I personally learned from Ansa Sosan, who's going to be here in just you know, a couple uh, talks after, that I can't wait for you to meet her in person. It's kind of amazing that she's here, <laughs> subhanAllah. But one of the things that I remember learning from Ansa Sosan is that a wife who does well as a wife is someone that when she marries, she understands that this man that she's married isn't hers. He isn't her property. He has a family, and he has parents, and he has siblings, and he has extended members of his family, and he needs to do right by them just like he needs to do right by her and this new family that he's creating. And a good wife pushes her husband towards his family, not away from his family. And this is what we see in Satina Khadija. She reminds him that his milk mother, what's Sayyidina Muhammad's milk mother's name? Halima, is out there. And how is she doing? So she reminds him, check up on the people that were important in your life. And they invite her over. And when Satina Halima comes over to visit with Satina Khadija, can you imagine? She tells her that there's hardships and there's famine and so on. And out of her generosity, Satina Khadija gives her all these sheep and all this wealth, you know what I mean, to go back with her. Not out of honor, of the family of her husband. She honors them. There was a uh, milk mother that the Prophet ﷺ had another one that was the slave of Abu Lahab, <laughs> right? And she tells the Prophet ﷺ, why don't we free her? 
purchased to free. And he says, this is an amazing idea. He didn't have the wealth, but she did, right? So she's honoring his family, honoring him through honoring his family. Do you see what I'm saying? It turns out that Abu Lahab said no, because Abu Lahab, as you know from the surah, <laughs> like he's not going to agree to this. But later on in life, this uh, milk mother does get freed, subhanAllah, but not in that story, because they do actually try, and he, he says no. But the story here, the point is that she honors her husband and honors her husband's family as well. She also surrenders in that whenever the Prophet Sallallahu now, as kind of imagine, kind of keep going forward, keep going forward in time, and they've had their children, and years into this, 15 years into this, because how old was the Prophet Sallallahu when he first received revelation? 40. So they were married for 15 years and had their six children, right, in that period of time, before revelation even comes. But when it does come, it's heavy, it's difficult, right? And the Prophet ﷺ doesn't know what this is that's coming. And this is where Sitina Khadija plays an incredibly important and pivotal role, right? Because what does she say? Because the first thing that ever happens, that the first step that ever, but the thing, the first thing that the Prophet notices that happens, right, is he actually sees Sayyidina Jibreel, the Archangel Gabriel. He sees him and he kind of is frozen because he sees him in the sky. He kind of sees him and he's just frozen, right? Not sure what, what this is or what to do with this, subhanAllah. And he hears, um, he, he hears him say, Oh, Muhammad, you are the messenger of God and I am the Archangel Gabriel. And he's frozen. <laughs> and he, he, stays, he stays frozen like that until Jibreel leaves. And at that point, as you can imagine, Sayyidina Muhammad runs back <laughs> to his family, right? Runs back to Sayyidina Khadija, and he's just, you know, um, you know, just very, very unsure of what all of this is, and she calms him down. She doesn't get all excited along with him. She calms him down, right? And so she says, and he says, I'm afraid I saw a devil. What if this is a devil that I saw? And so she says to him, Allah would never embarrass you. You treat your relatives well. You help the needy you protect the poor, and you come to the aid of the aggrieved, you are a wonderful host to your guests. Allah will never embarrass you. This is a good sign. Don't worry. Don't worry. And she calms him down. But then again, right, when prophecy comes, and he's at this point in time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, things are happening all around him. He's seeing lights. He starts to admit to her that he's seeing these lights, and he's hearing sounds. And a person like this, in SubhanAllah, on my field, I hear so many people in counseling say to me things like, I think I'm going crazy. I, I deal with this a lot. Right? And I say, no, 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 that's, that's not going crazy. That's just, you're dealing with difficult things. It can make you feel like you're going crazy, but that you're not actually going crazy, right? And so there are difficult things that are happening. So what does she do? She says, you're not going crazy. You're not, like all the people are starting to say, something is possessing Muhammad, he has evil magic, he has something, whatever, all these things that people, terrible things that there are, the rumors are spreading about him. She's the one in the background saying, what? No. You're fine. No, these are good signs. Allah is there for you because you are good to him and you are good to the people. So the Prophet ﷺ, and this is very important here, he starts slowly but surely going more and more and more where? Where does he go off to? The Ghar Hira, the cave of Hira. And in the cave of Hira, what is he doing there? This is all before revelation comes, you guys. What is he doing there? Yeah, he's contemplating. He's in solitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows something is greater but doesn't know exactly what, right? But feels that there's a heaviness and he needs that. You know, subhanAllah, I talk with sisters all the time, people all the time, and they're going through really, really heavy things. And I say, have you been praying about this? Have you spent some time alone with Allah to sort this out? No. If you are going through something heavy, what is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He did two things here. He isolated to really contemplate on what this is and give himself the time to really ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is this, right? Help me understand the signs. And number two, he sought out help. He went to Khadija and said, help me. What is this? What's going on here? He sought out support. And she helped him through this. Right? And so here's the Prophet وسلم, in Ghar Hira, and we know the story here, where finally, subhanAllah, here comes Sayyidina Jibreel and squeezes him tight. And what happens next? You know, 
You know, what happens next? What does he say? Iqra. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. Read. Read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clot of congealed blood. Read, your Lord is most merciful, generous, who taught by the pen, who taught man what he did not know. And can you imagine, as soon as he's finally released from this embrace that, that Sayyidina Jibreel is holding him, and what do you think he did with Prophet Sallallahu He went running down that mountain, right? Running over to Sitina Khadija. And he's trembling, shaking like a leaf. And what does she do? She calms him down. She holds him. She literally puts his head on her lap and holds him. Right? And she tells him, this is a good sign. But she's not sure either. So she goes to her trusted cousin, her mentor, Waraka. And she says, let's go to my cousin. So she takes the Prophet ﷺ to Waraqa, and they tell the whole story to him. And what does Waraqa say? He starts to cry. Because at this point in time, Waraqa is probably like 95 years old. Okay? And he says to them, I wish that I was young enough to be here to support you when your people kick you out. Khadija's saying, what? They're going to kick him out? Right? Like, like it dawns on her, like, this is the start of a very difficult chapter. And so at that point, it becomes clear that he's going to be expelled, and there's some heavy, heavy work to be done. And so the Prophet ﷺ continues to go back on more and more frequently. And here I'm going to pause for a minute. Have you guys seen Ghar Hira? Have you seen pictures of it? Maybe some of you have been there. Has anyone tried to climb it? It's hard. If you haven't seen it, don't please don't use your phones right now. But eventually, after this, Google Gharahira. What does this look like? It is where the where the the area where the Prophet ﷺ was saying is very high up. It's a hike. It's literally a hike up the mountain. Now remember, how old is Sitina Khadija at this story? How old is she? Fifty-five years old. I'm not going to ask you, obviously, as women, how old you all are. Mashallah. <laughs> I imagine we have many people here who are fifty-five and older. Right? And if you're not, you're eventually going to get there. Inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah give you a long life. Put yourself at age 55, hiking up this mountain. Because the Prophet ﷺ, more and more and more is going there. For longer and longer periods of time, it's heavier and heavier. Like, what is this prophecy that's come to him? Which means he needs food and water. And as a dedicated and devoted wife, there's your column of the different descriptions, right? She's very loyal. And she continues to take him food and water and hikes up the mountain just to give him the food and water and comes back down, hikes up and gives him the food and comes back down, right? Total dedication to a cause that she believes in, that this is righteous and this is the prophet of God, the final prophet. Think about that, subhanAllah, right? Now, 40 days later, comes yet another time where the Prophet ﷺ receives another revelation. Does anyone know what the second revelation is? Huh? Right? Now, what happens? The Prophet, وسلم, this is the backstory, he receives this revelation and he's, again, it's, it's, it's terrifying. You don't know what this exactly is. So he runs over to his wife and he says, and he's, you know, when you're like in fear and it's like you're drenched in cold sweat? And he says, cover me, cover me. So she covers him. And again, she puts him on her her lap. And he stays there for a very long time. But then suddenly he jumps up, says, Allahu Akbar. And she says, well, what happened? He's received the revelation in her home. And it says, Ya ayyuhal musammil. Oh, you who's wrapped up in the blanket. <laughs> That's what it says. Pray in the night. SubhanAllah. So it happens in her home. And so when it happens, he's, he does, you know, what is this? And so she says, this is from God. This is from God. This is revelation from God. So what is she doing here? Think about process what's happening here. She's believing him. 
She's his confidant. She's giving him support and strength. She's aiding him. Do you see what's happening here, subhanAllah? Yeah? And so, and so, mashallah, as we wrap up here, she's, the, without hesitating, she's also the first person to accept Islam. I didn't say the first woman. I said the first person. And there's no hesitation there. She accepts Islam, but when you are first at something and a pioneer at something, that means she's the first to make wudu after the Prophet She's the first to pray after the Prophet She's the first to pray in jama'ah, in congregation. She's the first at everything. A woman. So when people go on and on about women, oh, it's different for them in Islam, I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Let's, let's talk about our foremothers, mashallah. Right? And kind of like put things into perspective. So in wrapping up here, I'm going to say this. There's many other things that happen in Satina Khadija's life. Because what happens from this point on, we talked about until she got to 65, at uh, 55 rather, she doesn't actually live that much longer after this. But she goes through some really difficult things. Like not only were the people saying terrible things about her family, but her daughters ended up being divorced because of it too. Her daughters, two of them were married to two sons of Abu Lahab. And they forced the sons to divorce their wives. And another woman would have said, no, 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 no. Up until here, I draw my line. I don't want my daughters divorced, right? But she said, Allah will replace something better. And sure enough, that happened, right? Because the Tina Ruqayya, for example, ends up marrying who? Uthman ibn Affan, so <laughs> much better than the sons of Abu Lahab, right? Things are not always what they seem. This is a message that shows up over and over in Satina Khadija's life. She also loses her sons. And so they say to her about her, about Sayyidina Muhammad, that see, your lineage is cut off. As in to say, the understanding is that it goes through the sons, but that's not how prophecy works, right? And so this is difficult. So she's dealing with all these difficult things, subhanAllah. But the beautiful thing here that stands out and is completely unique about Satina Khadija is that when Sayyidina Jibreel would come with the wahi, with the revelation to give to the Prophet وسلم, oftentimes it was in her home and in her presence. And there was a time that she played a little experiment <laughs> to see, she had learned from Waraka that if it's truly an angel and not a devil, that they don't, uh, that, they, that they will turn away if there's any awra or nakedness showing. So she said to the Prophet وسلم, when he says, I see Sayyidina Jibreel, and so she says, okay, sit here on the side of her lap. Do you still see him? Yeah, I still see him. Okay, now come sit on the side of my lap. Do you still see him? Yeah, I still see him. <laughs> then she kind of moves her hijab, literally, like pulls it down just a little bit to show some hair. And she said, now do you see him? No, he disappeared. <laughs> it's amazing, smart, intelligent, right? She understands and is tuned in to these things. And the most beautiful, of course, story that sums it all up is that in one of the times where she, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is in Qadr Hira and she's going up to give him food and water, the Archangel Gabriel, Jibreel says to Sayyidina Muhammad, and this is the famous you know, hadith that we know, he says, your wife Khadija is coming to give you food and water. Give her salam from Allah and myself and tell her that she has been guaranteed a, pa a palace in paradise, after which she will not have any noise or fatigue. Allahu Akbar. That hadith right there, and if you just look at the little bit, noise and fatigue, if you think about the fact that what is she doing to allow her husband to be the prophet of God and the prophet of the ummah, she's holding up all the house chores. She's holding the fort down at home, literally. She's making it all work, and there's all these kids, not only not just her own, but also at this point in time, you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib is living with them, there's other young people living with them, there's Zayd ibn Haritha living with them, right? There's a lot of noise happening in her home, right? And she's managing this home by herself, sacrificing to allow her husband to be the prophet of God. So he says to her, you'll have a house in paradise with no noise and no fatigue. There's more to the story, subhanAllah, but we've run out of time. But needless to say, what Satina Khadija does with the rest of her life and the rest of her wealth is give it all to Islam. 
because soon after this, there's that embargo, as you know, where they embargo, right? They put an embargo on the Muslimin, they won't allow them to trade, and they're starving. And at the very end of Satina Khadija's life, she goes from this wealthy, wealthy, wealthy noble woman to having given away everything to the Muslims and to early Islam, to the point that she's on her deathbed. She is so starved and skinny because she's given away everything, that she herself is starved. And she's disease-ridden, and she's on her deathbed, and she uh, isn't going to recover. And the Prophet ﷺ is tearful. This is very difficult for him to see. And he says to her, what you've, if you've had difficulty here, you won't have difficulty there. SubhanAllah. And there she is at the very end of her life until the very end in full support and dedication to Islam to allow us to have this Islam and full dedication as the wife who is able to allow her husband to do this great and noble work and dedication to her children to allow them to become the mothers of the mu'mineen that we're going to hear about, at least for Sitina Fatima today. And when she passes away, it's the 27th night of Ramadan. And there she is of her 65 years of life. She spent 25 years of them with the Prophet And in that period of time, like I said, her name is Khadija, born ahead of her time, not just physically, but ahead of her time in breaking all kinds of stereotypes and barriers experienced by women. And not for the sake of feminism, <laughs> but for the sake of doing what's right, for the sake of standing up to her beliefs, for the sake of charting her own path. But that path is a path, even though it's charted, it's surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she's strong, she's independent, she's courageous, she is supportive of her husband, but the dunya never gets to her head. That wealth that she has never enters into her heart. She gives and gives and gives, subhanAllah. And with that, we conclude, mashaAllah, Sitina Khadija, not just as the wealthy, noble woman that we often refer to her as, but somebody with nobility and intelligence and independence becomes that role model for all of the women here who have a chart to path in life that's different than others and difficult and do, do so with full surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing he's going to carry us through. Barakallahu feekun wa sallallahu ma'ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.